up and, and do a quick intro. <laughs> um, so I am Anna Pill, I'm the executive director here at the Arts Center. And um, basically, we are so happy to have these three wonderful people joining us here today, not just for a talk live in person with you, but also YouTube live stream. And so um, if there's anybody who hears about this event after the fact, it's like, oh man, I wish I had gone to that. They can check it out on our YouTube channel. It's gonna be posted up at the end of the day and they can have, I mean, like, check back in and take a look and enjoy. Um, so today we have Deborah Davis, who is the creator of the lovely paintings that you see around the room, as well as Anthony Childs, whose work has been superseded by PowerPoint, um, but you will all be able to <laughs> view at when the talk is completed, and it is a wonderful sound and video installation all about mods, and actually some music played by mods. <laughs> In a way, that they accompany you. <laughs> and so, um, some very interesting stuff, but here uh, we also have Dr. Justin Manson from UVA, whose work is largely on bees, um, but pollinators in general. And so she's going to add a little bit of that science element and why these creatures are so important, while the artists discuss why they're so inspiring and what kind of brought them to create the artwork that they do. So we hope that you enjoy it, and I am going to let them speak to their strengths. <laughs> Where should we start? <laughs> start with you. You want to start with me? <laughs> All right, I can give yeah. some sort of general biological background. Are you guys okay to run the PowerPoints or is there a clicker? How do oh, you... yes. So as soon as you're going to get started at this time, you can certainly start there. Sure, and I will keep it short, I promise. I didn't prepare a lot on purpose. So you can actually just use that mouse right in front of you. Hi, so I'm um, Dr. Jessamine Manson. I'm an assistant professor at UVA. I have put this picture up and this information up in case anyone has questions after the talk, you can reach me. I'm also easy to find on Google because my name combination is fairly unique. So you can just look it up and you'll know, track me down. Um, this is not a moth related picture, but a pollination related picture. So I figured I'd start there. I'm a pollination biologist and a chemical ecologist, which means I study plant chemistry, um, and I'm very interested in how plants and pollinators and other insects kind of fit together. And so while my specialty is bees, native bees, uh, I think about moths a lot, and so it's really fun to kind of think about moths some more. So let's see if I can make this work. Here we go. Next. Okay. Oh, boy. So <laughs> um, I wanted to start just by telling you about how many moths there are in the world. So um, if we look at Lepidopterans, which is butterflies and moths together, globally there are about 160,000 species. And of those, the butterflies tend to be the more, more, I don't want to say charismatic in this room of beautiful paintings, but generally speaking, right, we think of Lepidopterans, we think of butterflies. They actually represent only 18,000 of those species. So they're a small, small fraction of all Lepidopterans. The vast majority, about 90% are moths. Um, and what's interesting about moths and what's so fabulous to be in this space is that many times when we think of moths, we think of um, little brown nondescript creatures that we kind of keep flitting around, but instead there's actually a huge amount of diversity in moth size, biology, color, all of those things. Um, so I'm showing you actually, um, I don't know if I can point here, but there's a... Um, We've got a phylogeny here. It's basically an evolutionary tree of all butterflies and moths on the right side of the screen. And there's just, I'm gonna stand up for a second and do this. There's just this very small fraction right in here that are actually the butterflies. And I wanna point that out because butterflies are embedded within the Lepidopteran family. They're not their own branch. They're actually very closely related to moths and actually telling them apart is one of the biggest challenges. So if you think about butterflies and moths, well, you know, what are some of the characteristics that we use to differentiate these? Someone said define a butterfly versus a moth. What would you, what would you say? Generally, butterflies are more colorful, but then also like growing up, it was like, oh, butterflies sit with their wings open and moths. You're absolutely right. One of the biggest, uh, best ways to sort of tell them apart, there's always exceptions to every rule, is how they hold their wings. They're exactly right. So butterflies holding their wings sort of up or perpendicular and um, moths holding their wings parallel. Yeah, there are some other generalizations that we have about these groups, like um, colorfulness or flying at night versus during the day that are sometimes true, but often not. And so it's sort of a fascinating group because they do everything. 
And so trying to characterize them is actually really challenging. So I've just got a couple of pictures of cool rocks up here to kind of look at. Let's see if I can make this. So when I heard about coming out here to talk to you guys about mods, I got a bit overwhelmed because there are 140,000 species of mods in the world. And I thought, how am I going to tell you about mods from a biological perspective um, without kind of just getting lost? So I decided to stick to one group of mods and tell you just a few short stories about that group. We're going to talk today about hawk moths, pardon me. Um, so these are what we call sphingids, that's their family. And these are really familiar moths to most of us because we've seen them uh, in our gardens and we've seen them sort of flying around. So these are the tomato hornworms that eat your tomato plants. Oh yes. But also they're a fabulous group um, globally distributed that do all kinds of other cool biological things. So I've just got some pictures of different kinds of sphingids up here. So related hawk moths. And this is the one we'll talk, we'll talk about two different ones, but the guy we've got here with this life cycle, that's, um, that's the tomato hornworm, which turns into sort of our classic hawk moth that we have around here called Manduca sexta or curious. So I wanted to just tell you a couple of quick stories about this really cool moth. And these stories kind of, uh, they're very broad and they kind of give you a sense of moths in general. So this is a classic story that I'm gonna tell you. This is not Manduca sexta, this is another sphingid that you're looking at, another type of hawk moth. So why this story is so fascinating is that flower on the far right of the screen. That's the star orchid. It's a plant um, from Madagascar that was first discovered in the 1860s. It was sent as a specimen to Darwin, right? This is not a new story to everyone, I can tell. Um, and Darwin looked at this flower and pointed out this structure here. This is the nectary, right? This is where the nectar that this plant produces to attract pollinators is. And this nectary is, I think it's 25 centimeters. Like this is a crazy long nectary very unusual. Darwin looked at this flower and went, well, clearly something has to pollinate it. It must be something with a very long tongue. And so he predicted that there would be a moth with a tongue of that length. He did not live to see that prediction to fruition. He uh, first saw this plant in the 1860s. He died in the 1880s. In 1903, this moth was discovered in Madagascar. Um, it's closely related to a moth from continental Africa. Um, and it has, as predicted, this incredibly long tongue that allows it to visit this plant and pollinate it effectively. You've got kind of a cartoon of how that works in the middle. So this story really just illustrates the sort of tight relationship between moths and the plants that they pollinate and visit, and um, how much uh, how much evolution has occurred between and coevolution has occurred between these groups of selection or evolution. Um, to ensure that there's a good match between these plants and these pollinators so that they can both do their jobs effectively. So kind of a classic story um, and a really cool story about testing hypotheses as well. The next story I want to tell you, this is Manduca sexta, so our classic hawk moth. We're now back in North America, we've left Madagascar. Um, and again, there's that hornworm that's very familiar. What might be less familiar is this plant. We're now um, in the sort of southwestern part of the United States, generally speaking. This is um, jimson weed. How many know jimson weed? So what's fascinating about jimson weed is it is a really, really toxic plant, right? In fact, in some cultures, it is a sort of medicinal and spiritual plant. Um, and it is also pollinated by hawk moths. What's fascinating about this story is it's also consumed by hawk moths. And so here is a plant that has a problem to solve. When um, the hawk moths are larvae, when they're caterpillars, this plant needs to defend itself. It can't be so tasty that it gets completely eaten by this hawk moth. However, when, it is, when the hawk moths are mature, this plant needs to be attractive enough to get pollinated. And so this plant is in this quandary of dealing with how to defend itself from the herbivore stage, how to attract the pollinator stage and how to survive and make seeds all at the same time. And I can tell you more stories about how it does that, but it has found a way to be toxic enough to not get completely eaten, but not so toxic to kill its pollinator, which is a really kind of fascinating story. The third story I'm gonna tell you, and the last story I'm gonna tell you, is about hawk moths, larvae as 
destructive organisms, which they unfortunately are, and some of the uh, relationships that they have with other organisms. So this picture here was taken in my, uh, at my house with my porch. This is my tomato plant getting eaten by a hawk moth, but I was very excited to see that the hawk moth larvae, the tomato hornworm, eating my tomatoes, was covered in these little white cocoons. These little white cocoons are the cocoons of the parasitoid wasps that you see on the right side of the screen. This is a Cotesia uh, species of wasp. Um, and so essentially what has happened to this caterpillar is earlier in its life, an adult wasp came along, laid some eggs inside the caterpillar, stabbed through the skin, and those uh, larvae emerged and have pupated on the outside of the caterpillar and will eventually, I did not take this other picture, that requires some fancy microscopy that I'm not such a, so skilled at, but will emerge to become this next generation of wasps. Now what's cool about this story is these wasps don't kill hawk moths, but they carry a virus. And the virus they carry affects the hawk moth's ability to pupate and become an adult. And so they do have an ability to keep these populations of moths under control. And in fact, these wasps are used commercially to do just that as a biological control agent in cases where people are trying to grow tomatoes and the hawk moths are getting a little bit too voracious. So they play a really interesting role in being sort of a foundation in the ecosystem as well. So moths as herbivores, moths as hosts, moths as pollinators, they play a lot of different roles. Um, these are just a few examples, but they're a really big group and a really dynamic group with lots of important ecological um, roles and implications. That's all I have to say. So, and I'm happy to, do you guys want to do questions as we go? Or? Uh, well, we can finish up on, uh, at the end and kind of synthesize all of you. So that sounds great. That sounds great. Let's do that. All right. Well, I'll go next. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to take my mask off just because I have a hard time talking <laughs> with the mask on. Um, so I paint. I'm an artist. Um, and for almost 10 years now, I've painted moths. Because um, I'm also nerdy um, about these insects and these things. And um, I started getting interested in moths when I was a kid, moths and butterflies, all the lepidoptera. Kind of went away from it, did many, many other things. I did study art in college. But I feel like this work, these paintings, actually bring together everything that I'm interested in, between environment, I worked as a gardener for many years, so between plants, environment, bugs, art, it kind of all coalesces into this, into this work. Um, and people say, why do you paint, paint moths? And the first, the simple answer is they're beautiful. Um, the other reason, or, or a big reason for me is so people can see them. Um, they're mostly at night. There are a few day flying moths, but it, it generally they're nocturnal. So people don't know. All of these moths I've seen at my house in, in Albemarle County. So they're not exotic. Um, they're, they're something you see all the time. But I paint them large. I have them still. So I give you a really intimate look of what, what they're like, and I also like to show the diversity. I mean, there are probably somewhere around 3,000 species of moths in the mid-Atlantic area. Um, some of them are so tiny, I can't even see them well enough to paint them, but they go from very, very tiny to, to quite large, actually, like as big as my hand. Uh, so it's a fascinating thing to do uh, to actually look for moths and so then, then to paint them. Uh, they're also important. I want to, I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm the moth ambassador. Um, they're very, very important. In fact, one of the things that has been said to me um, is that we really probably wouldn't have birds without moths, truly, because one of their main environmental purposes is, is bird feed. Um, people, you put out seeds and you feed birds all the time, but to raise a brood of baby birds, they actually have to have 
protein. They have to have the bugs. They can't do it on seed. Uh, so they, they really need bugs. And the main bugs, because there's so many, it's just in sheer biomass in this vicinity, caterpillars are the best thing. I mean, they can eat mosquitoes. They can eat other little things. Beetles are kind of crunchy. But a caterpillar is like a package of nutrition. And it goes, it goes a long ways. So they're very, very important um, in the environment. And I, I want to just raise awareness. And I also like to talk about what the host plants are. So the really common ones are going to have a number of different host plants. They can, you know, the, the caterpillars uh, feed on a variety of plants. That means it's going to be, and then some things might only have one host plant. That's probably going to be a less common moth. But um, to me, you know, making them still, I call these the formal portraits. Um, it's basically what I do. So um, bigger than life. And like I said, it, it makes them really intimate. Um, one show opening that I had, this guy walked up to me and said, all the moths in my house are white. I'm like, no, they aren't. <laughs> He's like, no, they really are. I'm like, no, you see all these spots? <laughs> they, they would be where you live, too. But, you know, that's the thing. He didn't get it. He just sees a few things flip by, maybe go by the, the porch light or in the car headlights. And you don't see what they really look like. You just see something flitting by. So they're mysterious. And that's one of the reasons why I like being able to paint them is because they're they're mysterious creatures. You know, people really have no idea what's out there at night. Um, so it's fascinating. And I have to say, one of the I think the main thing that expresses what I what I'm really trying to do here is a quote by Mary Oliver. I use this one a lot. It's instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So that's really what I'm doing. So I'm going to go. I don't think I need to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony. Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony. I do uh, music and photography. Um, my interest in moths is mostly visual. So, in and of that, I also like to do macro photography. And part of that has to do with um, showing someone something that they know what it is, but showing them part of it to a point that they do not know what they're looking at. Just to show not only the, uh, how intricate pretty much any kind of life form is, but um, I'm just more interested in abstracts. And in terms of music, um, part of this project um, sort of started a couple of years ago when I gutted the piano and took out the, uh, I guess they call it the soundboard, where the strings are attached to the wooden piece that is the reverb chamber of, the, of your piano, so the pedal that extends the sound, and shining a UV light onto that because I wanted to attract moths against the visual background of it, but also um, because they will hit the strings as they fly into it, crawl over it, crawl behind it, crawl between the strings and the body, and make, make sounds. So um, that actually came about when I was underneath the piano before it was fully gutted. I happened to notice a spider was laying uh, a, a I guess it's a, a bed of a, a web, web to lay eggs and cover it up. And while I was doing that, which took about 45 minutes for the spider to do that, above me, moths and bugs are hitting the strings. And so I'm hearing this while I'm videoing this, this spider doing its thing, and I'm like, wow, I should take all of this apart. So it's completely exposed. The strings are completely exposed. And we'll see what happens. And so um, I've done a little bit of that, 
And also I do tend to incorporate natural sounds into my music just because it's all around us and it's in and it of itself music and also communication of a type. Well, it's, it's, it is communi definite communication. Um, so that also informs some of my music making, but not all of it, but that's sort of um, where I am now. And, uh, so yeah, you get the visual aspect against the piano and the very, like, again, so many different types of moths in your own backyard. All you need is a torch light and anything special. You really don't. Um, depending on where you are, you may need more than that because of other major light pollution. But it's 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 simple, it's easy, and it's very inexpensive, and all you can do is stay up late. <laughs> get up really early. And, or get up really early, early. The birds get up at five, so if you can get up a little bit earlier than that, the birds will come and eat the moths. Yeah. So yeah, and I'll, that's another thing that's that's in the background of my songs. A lot of birds. So birds and moths are linked. A food source, they come by and frustrate me all the time. <laughs> Many times I, uh, I'll see uh, the wings splattered on the ground. It's like, ah, oh, bird got that one. And it's these gorgeous wings, but food. So we have to understand that's how they live, and it's completely natural. It's frustrating, though. <laughs> Well, at this point, I uh, feel like we can open it up to questions. Um, anything that anybody wants to know about moths, we have some real pros. <laughs> so I, I have a question, um, just to kind of kick things off. I mean, everybody, and, and I've seen it here, you know, people will come in and they will immediately gravitate towards the black bearded looper, probably because they're looking, everybody is very familiar with Luna moths. We see them. Um, how common would you say a Luna moth is versus the moth that you have in the exhibition? Oh, very common. Blooms are, but you know, moths are are seasonal. Like for instance, Luna moths show up in the spring. They're kind of an early moth, and so I don't really see many now. But we're talking March, April into May. Um, there have been times I've had like nine or ten. Sitting at my light at once. Um, so they're blue, they're very common. And green moths are actually fairly common in general. Like a lot of moths are green. I mean, I kind of like green moths, so uh, I do like them in some things. But, but lunars are great, and um, everybody, most people remember when they see a lunar. Like if the, the lunar, if they happen to run into one, sitting somewhere or at the porch light or coming to their window it's so dramatic that it's an experience people truly remember it, it really and a lot of these guys are pretty small compared to the luna moth i mean most of them like that yellow dusted moth is extremely tiny almost so tiny you can barely see it um but it has amazing iridescence on the wings and it's it's just a pretty interesting moth but but lunas are big, bulge, and dramatic, and yeah, pretty common, I would say. Well, and you also gave us a little bit of information about native plants. So maybe, what are some things that people can do? I mean, you all have discussed how important these creatures are. What are some things that people can do in their own gardens to kind of encourage moths so that we can have nice, big, fat birds? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, was, I worked as a gardener for many, many, many years <laughs> and tried to steer my clients that way. Um, I, I tell people, start with the tree layer. I mean, trees are very important. Like if you plant an oak tree, you'll, and if he, there's a book called uh, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, and he, he'll actually go through each of the plants and, you know, trees and shrubs and tell you how many species of lepidoptera that will support. And oak trees, I can't remember, it's in hundreds of different species if you plant an oak tree. Um, and so I tell people, at least if you're going to, you know, make any investment in your yard, natives, plant native trees. Like, in other words, stay away from things like ginkgo, even though I'm, I'm an herbalist and I think ginkgo just 
Cool. But there aren't any bugs here that'll eat those. Um, and so, you know, we want to stick to native trees as much as possible. And then go to the shrub layer and start looking at native shrubs as opposed to um, a lot of the ornamental shrubs. And, and some of the natives are quite lovely. So, um, you know, and I've, get, I've gotten so I actually shop plants um, according to what will eat them. Like, you know, like I'm trying to get button bushes to grow because there's a certain stink spot that we love to those. And I want those. So, you know, that kind of thing. But anybody else have something to say about plants? So, you just touched on it. One of the challenging things about supporting Lepidopter in your backyard is that they have two life stages, and at those two life mm -hmm. stages, they eat completely different things. Mm -hmm. So, as caterpillars, they're pests most of the time. And so if you want lots of lepidoptera, you have to kind of accept, we were talking about this before we started, accept the damage on your tomato plants, accept the damage on your trees. They need to eat leaf material usually, although sometimes they're eating other things, roots and other things. As adults, as moths, they need a nectar source. And so it, it requires a little bit of planning because you need to think about both of those things. They happen at different times of the year a lot of the time, so that's good. You can have transitions in your garden if you want to plant. For that, but you need to plant for both flowering and leaf bearing organisms or plants. And so that can just, it requires a little additional uh, planning. As a, I, I'm a bee person uh, by, by training, and we're lucky, we, we're looking for one kind of food most of the time, right? Just nectar and pollen sources. We don't have that whole uh, herb, uh, herbivore stage where you're um, leaf driven. So it's not a simple. It's not a simple thing. I think it requires a lot of thought, and I think what Deborah said is exactly the right thing. With also that emphasis on most states with native plants are going to do uh, do a lot more to support diversity in our area. We're still fortunate to have largely native dominated moss communities, so they need largely native plants. And now there are this, this whole category of moths that do not nectar. They don't eat as adults. So. Like the luna moths, we talked about luna moths. Luna moths do not eat, period, once they become an adult. And so all the giant silk moths are not pollinators at all. Where some of them, like all the hawk moths that you mentioned, are very busy pollinators. Um, and leapers, and anyway, there's a, there are whole categories of moths that are really the night crew. Um, as far as pollination goes. And the plants that are fragrant at night are actually there doing that to attract the moths, like the, the Darwin thing. Um, that, and I had that orchid at one point. It only smells at night. It doesn't have no, it has no scent, period, in daylight hours. But at night, the scent just pumps out, and that's why Darwin knew it had to be a moth, you know, so it's like, oh, it's a night thing that's, that's coming to pollinate this plant, so night fragrant plants are particularly nice for, for moths, um, but they you know, I don't white, hate right? moths, they, huh? they tend to be white, and tend to be white, yeah. it's light colored, yeah, yeah, so they contrast against the background for the poor vision of the moth right. at night, you're exactly right, yeah, evening primrose is a good Good um, pollinator slash night plant. So anyway, it's all connected. <laughs> oh, hi, thank you. By the way, um, and you mentioned how birds love moths. So what is the relationship with bats? Well, bats. Oh, bats love moths. Oh yeah. In fact, that when I'm out at night with my with my UV lights out. And I go checking it out. There are bats flapping around behind me constantly. You know, they're trying to nab, nab them before they get to the moss sheet. Once they're sitting on the sheet, the bats don't usually bother them. How about you, Anthony? You moth a lot. Yeah, you? I don't get many bats. I get more frogs than birds. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. They, and actually, um, uh, praying mantises. Uh, mantis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you set up a light. Um, for me, if you, I set up my light in, in a specific spot. Um, after a few days, oh, and skinks, skink lizards, love moths. Um, they, uh, all the uh, wildlife surrounding will recognize at this part of the day, there's a bevy of food, a whole bank of food waiting for them. So if it's raining, you're going to get some frogs or um, some other types of 
others. Um, but most I'll get birds and uh, and uh, mammoths at night. Yeah, and I, I and oh, and also one thing I get are the really giant spiders uh -huh. and are spiders, like hanging yeah. out around the edge, waiting for a moth. You know, to grab so spiders. There's usually on yeah, right. frogs along the toads along the bottom. Bats flying around behind me. So it's really fascinating, you know. And then I'll get an owl showing up. You know, they all kind of it's like a little I don't know, like a crossroads or something, or, you know, they see those UV lights, and uh, a lot of critters may show up. One fun thing in, in, in the piano that I saw, um, during the day, um, I was out on the back porch, and the piano was sitting about 15 feet to my right, and I hear some, some scuttling along the rocks, along the pathway, and it's a pink lizard that's coming from where it's living to the piano. And it crawls up inside the piano through the spaces between the strings and the body because a lot of times all kinds of bugs will crawl up in there during the night and stay there, maybe uh, even set up shop there. So a lot of eggs being laid there, a lot of um, spider webs in there, and the skinks will come up there and they will hunt for bugs during the day. And I didn't realize this, I've had, I've had that piano set up where it was for about two years, and I didn't realize this literally until about three and a half, four months ago, where uh, it's like, and I, and I just happened to hear it, and I had no clue that they were doing it, and they've been doing it for a while. Also, the piano is lean, lean, lean. What's the word for that? What's the <laughs> proper English for that? Anyway, it's leaning up against the wall, and there's another piece of the piano that's on top of that. So there's a space between the piano and the wall, about, you know, about this big. Also this summer, for the first time, I noticed the bird, a bird, a Carolina wren, had set up a nest in, in that little space. Had four babies. <laughs> yeah, and after they flew the coop, I happened to, to pull the piece off, and I pulled up the nest, just, I just pulled it up for, I don't even know why, and there's a big fat skink sitting underneath the nest that I set up top after they had left. <laughs> So, and I was taking pictures of it, and it was completely still. I thought it was dead, and it was just sleeping. It was just sleeping with one eye open. So, <laughs> so this this thing that I set up to make sounds with bugs hitting it became a habitat. On a complete, I, I did not mean to do that, but I should have realized that that's what's going to happen because once you do something, the nature surrounding it will make use of it, whatever it is. So if you've got a pile of leaves. The birds will get it and make nests out of it. If you have a pile of wood, bugs will come in, lay their larvae into it, like a run up rhinoceros will come and lay their larvae into it. So, whatever you have lying around will be made use of because that's what nature does. It, it does what it needs to be done with what has to do with it. So, little fun, little fun, little experiences completely beyond what I thought was going to happen with what I was doing. What is it about UV lights that attracts moths? It's a particular wavelength? Yeah, so insects see differently than we do. They see in the ultraviolet range. And so for them, that's a pretty normal part of their, uh, of their visual uh, range, if that makes sense. And so we actually see a lot of plants using different, that if you flash ultraviolet lights on flowers, they have different patterns that only insects can see. So that's a big part of it. It's just they see differently than we do. So for them, that's sort of more natural part. So I, I, I you guys may actually know much more about them. Yeah, what do they UV lights? But. I've read so many things about why why do they come to UV light mm -hmm. at night, and nobody knows exactly. Um, there are theories that I've read um, that they, at, without us plugging in UV lights, they use the moon to navigate. And so we're that. sort of fooling them a little bit um, by turning on these UV lights. They don't quite know what's going on. They're used to moonlight. Um, and that's why I actually do not run my UV lights every night because I feel like they're, and they don't, they aren't mating. They aren't doing what they need to do when I have those lights on. They just come and they Prince. mostly just sit <laughs> at the, at, I have a sheet on the side of my shed with the UV lights on. And they just come and sit. 
Um, so they're not mating, they're not pollinating, they're not doing all the stuff they should be doing. So um, I only turn my lights on like maybe three nights a week, you know, and I give them breaks and me breaks. Uh, I get more sleep. Um, but anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting. And so then certain moths show up at different times of the night. Like I will know that certain moths will show up early as soon as it gets dark. But then like the silt moths, like lunas and stuff, don't show up until after midnight. They never show up until after midnight. I don't know why. I have no clue about that. But, but I've gotten so I'm, I'm used to looking for certain moths at certain times of night. So I kind of make sure I can't go to bed real early. Or, you know, sometimes it would be better if I get up, like, an hour before dawn, something like that, and that usually works best. But, anyway, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> we don't know. Well, we can take one more question before we <laughs> send you all off for more mopping. <laughs> Anybody have anything else that they wanted to ask? Somebody was saying something about the difference between the male and the female earlier, and I think that's the whole thing. Can you repeat that? Sure. We can use paintings as an example. So there are a number of differences. Obviously, there's genitalia, but the best way to tell a male and a female moth part, you obviously need the same two, two of the same species, is looking at their antenna. So if you look behind you at the blackberry looper, that is a male moth. It has feathery antenna, and it uses this feathery antenna to look for females uh, through chemoreception, so pheromone signaling. So those, those, each of those little hairs on the antenna are picking up chemical signals of females. And then if you see a moth with smooth antenna, that is most likely a female moth because they aren't trying to um, find the males, the males will come to them. That's how the moth mating world works, so they have, don't need to invest in that. So um, there's a difference in color as far as color. There can be, yes, there definitely can be. Okay. Like lots of species that can have that sort of sexual dimorphism, right? Like birds are a great example. Yeah, they, but it depends on the species. Yeah. I think moths really don't mate according to sight, you know, if they look at the pheromone thing. But male and female often are different, you know, so yeah. it depends, you know, but they're being the pheromone haters. Yeah. Does that determine, like, what birds eat what moths? Like, are they more attracted to the moths or the female moths? Or... Gosh, that's an excellent. I think it's more like plants that they eat. I find uh, certain moths aren't very well, like monarch butterflies are actually a good example. They eat milkweeds and um, the birds don't love them. You know, they have, a, I guess, a bitter taste. But then there's a, another moth, a butterfly that's very similar called the viceroy. It looks almost identical, but evidently that one's tastier, but the birds think it's the other one. Anyway, so I think a lot, a lot of the, whether the moth is powerful or not has to do with um, the plants. And I understand tomato hornworms really do taste like tomatoes. <laughs> I actually, there's, a, yeah, somebody had used, used them as a pizza topping. Oh and said they were just like eating tomatoes. Just I'm not going to recommend that. <laughs> some, of, some, some caterpillars are actually uh, poisonous. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Around here, uh, milkweed caterpillars, mm -hmm. you know, monarch caterpillars, uh, milkweed, don't, don't eat them. Toxic. Yeah, uh, pipe fine swallowtail, don't eat them. Toxic. Um, <laughs> think about those plants. That think about what they're eating. eating. <laughs> if they're eating a toxic plant, they're probably sequestering Dad, those toxins. Dad, what's the plant, what's the moth that eats poison ivy? Oh, oh, yeah, there's a great little moth that eats poison ivy. In fact, there's several. There's one called um, Ipatis. Oh, right. I think that's how it's pronounced. Tiny little thing, cool looking moth, and I have painted it. Uh, and po poison ivy is the host plant. Um, and there, so there are several that eat poison ivy. So we don't want to eat that moth or the caterpillar. <laughs> not a good idea, probably. But yeah, it's so great. And then there, there are moths that eat dead leaves, leaf litter. There's a whole category of litter moths that, were, that eat, not the adult moths, but the caterpillars eat dead leaves. So they're, they're busy. They're busy out there. So a question. Um, so I, I, saw, I follow you on Instagram, and I saw that you. So how you paint them? Do you do you protect them and then um, kill them? Yeah. Um, 
at my moth sheet, if there's something really interesting that I want, that I think I want to paint um, or get a better photograph of, yeah, I actually put them in a jar, which is really pretty easy. You just kind of walk over the jar and grab mm -hmm. it. It's not, if they're sitting there in the light, kind of. So I put it in the refrigerator until the next day. And I want to get the colors in the daylight. One is an artist, I just want to see colors in daylight so I know I'm really getting accurate color. Um, and so, you know, around midday, I photograph all the moths that I caught the night before and then I let them go. I don't kill them, I don't collect them, I don't have a bunch of dead things sitting around in boxes. I don't, don't do that. Um, no need. Digital photography is fabulous. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I do. And, and they, they chilling them. I can actually get a decent photograph. Yeah, it gives me a little more time. Now, the tinier they are, sometimes I can't even get it. They'll get away before I even get a good, anywhere close to a shot. But um, the bigger ones, especially, it's much easier. The big fat bodies, um, they really slow down a lot. So it's easy to get a good photograph. And so, yeah, I have thousands of moth photographs, and you know, just in my computer that I can pull up for for painting. And so that's what I do um, after the fact. Because totally they don't harmless. sit still for a portrait. You know? And it's totally harmless. It's like being yeah. out on our on our September nights, right, where it goes down to right. 40 degrees. That's basically what we, what you do when you yeah, do the same thing. Do not freeze them. Don't, don't freeze them. them. Oh, yeah. that is harmless. I'm like, no, no, no. no. But fridge is totally fine. fine. Absolutely. Fine. Um, That's right. Yeah. Right. Fridge is, is, is a nap, not a long nap, a nap. Right. So yeah, I always say they probably think they've been captured by some alien force. You know, they're in this weird cold place, and the light comes on, the light goes off, the light comes on, the light comes off. You know? They go home and tell stories. To yeah. Their friends. yeah. <laughs> like, oh, what happened to me? Something weird happened last night. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we're just a little moths flying around somewhere. To somebody we are. Well, wonderful. If there aren't any other questions, I thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, but thank you all three for joining us, Anthony, Deborah, and Justin, and um, thank you all for coming. To the talk, and for everybody who joined us on YouTube, we had three viewers. <laughs> so hello. Um, and so. I'm going to go ahead and play Anthony's videos after this. We're going to stop the live feed. Um, if you want to see the videos, you, you're going to have to come visit us in the gallery. And um, the show continues until September 25th. So we are open regular hours Monday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So please come back from your moth loving friends. And um, any questions, we're always happy to share with the artists and uh, get those questions answered. So thank you.